Good afternoon and welcome as the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston presents the 2023 inaugural International Women's Day Symposium, centered around leadership, empowerment, achievement, and diversity, uniting women locally and globally to lead with purpose. My name is Marian Maldonado, and I am the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. And together with the entire team, we want to welcome all of you here today. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize our special friends here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas Houston branch, World Affairs Council board member Darren Peschel and his great team here. Also joining us today, President Lori Logan, he'll be giving our opening remarks. Thank you both and to your teams, because they're wonderful. Have you all enjoyed this amazing facility? Isn't it gorgeous? How many of you seen the spectacular views and all the money? Did you see all the money? <laughs> Craziness. The World Affairs Council is Houston's premier international affairs educational organization, presenting speakers such as Ambassador Nikki Haley, Ambassador Susan Rice, Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison, and most recently, Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Our programs are designed for both adults and students, and the World Affairs Council delivers over 100 programs annually, specifically designed for globally-minded leaders like you. We have programs for high school students. We have adult continuing education and career development, global enrichment opportunities, as well as the Council's global learning through travel programs. So there's really something for everyone. If you're interested in the world, like to travel the world, want to see the world, uh, the World Affairs Council is your opportunity to, to do that with like-minded people. I hope you all saw some of the, the leaflets outside. We have some at your table. We do a plethora of different things. I'll tell you about those in just a second, but don't forget to take those on your way out. Uh, th again, the World Affairs Council is open to anyone who wants to learn more about the world. We host programs uh, and events all across the Houston region. And thank you to the Council's partners, members, and friends who help support global education here in Houston. I'm sure you'll want to know about some of our upcoming programs, and uh, here's a few that you'll want to note. We have our international affairs competition for high school students called Academic World Quest. This is a, an international affairs competition that we host annually, and the winning high school team gets to go to Washington, D.C. to compete in our national competition, and we fully scholarship them to go. So if you have a high school student in your life or community, please let them know Academic World Quest is coming up at the end of this month. We also have the Global Scholars Academy, and this is a summer camp, foreign affairs camp for high school students. We'll have it all across Houston. It's going to be in the north side, downtown. It's going to be on the west side. So high school students in your life, you want to uh, add to their college resume, make sure you have them attend the Global Scholars Academy. And both of these are provided by the generous support of the Hess Corporation, who is our 2023 educational sponsor. We also have um, some amazing trips. How many of you have traveled with us? A few hands here. We have some amazing trips, unlike any other trip you've been on. Um, we have learning trips that are going uh, on a safari and a visit to my, Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, that's going to be in Tanzania later in uh, the year, as well as we have an amazing trip that will likely also sell out to explore Cuba. So if you're interested in those two countries or a host of others, we have our travel little pocket uh, flyer for you, and you can see all the places that we have planned to go in 2023. Additionally, we also have upcoming programs with the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, will be joining us soon, and uh, an exclusive VIP limited, limited amount luncheon. It's going to be kind of an intimate affair with Stephen Hadley, the 20th United States National Security Advisor. So you can find out about all of these programs and a host of others by visiting our website at www.houston.org. Now on to the affair of the afternoon. 
The inaugural 2023 International Women's Day Symposium celebrates the global achievements made by women across economic, social, cultural, and political arenas. International Women's Day is celebrated globally with its origins traced back to the earliest 20th, earliest 20th century when women around the world began to demand better working conditions, equal pay, and the right to vote. In 1975, the United Nations officially recognized International Women's Day. And since that time, we have celebrated it annually. Today, we enjoy the achievements of many women in our history, but we also choose to aspire for greater rights, privileges, and benefits for all. Whether you're here representing the banking, energy, transportation, medicine, sports, or some other industry, I know that you're here for a reason, and to learn, to share, to connect, to grow with other celebrated leaders from across our great city. The World Affairs Council has designed today's inspirational afternoon with expertly curated panel sessions, an elegant afternoon tea service, a thoughtful mindfulness moment, beautiful music, and an exquisite champagne reception in the back room at the end of the afternoon. It's my sincere hope that you enjoy our first annual symposium. And now it is my honor to welcome the World Affairs Council board member and senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas Houston branch, Darren Peschel. Darren. Well, thank you, Mary Ann, for that kind introduction. Well, we at the Dallas Fed are thrilled to partner with the Houston World Affairs Council to host today's inaugural symposium. And on behalf of our nation's central bank, I want to extend a happy International Women's Day to each of you. Mary Ann and Sandhya, I remember when the idea of today's symposium was just a pipe dream, and we weren't sure if anybody would come. So it's heartwarming to look around the room today and see that full capacity, to feel the energy in the room, and really to marvel at the list of all-star speakers that we have today. As Marianne mentioned, I have the privilege of serving on the HWAC board, so I have a firsthand account of the work that they do on a daily basis. And it is my view that no one in Houston does more to promote understanding of the world than the council, from its pol politics, to policies, to economies, to cultures, the council does it best. Thank you, Marianne and Sandhya, for your efforts to position Houston to be a recognized leader in the international community. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce another recognized leader, our keynote speaker, Lori Logan. Lori Logan is the 14th president and chief executive office, officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and the first woman to serve in that role. She represents the 11th Federal Reserve District on the Federal Open Market Committee in the formulation of U.S. monetary policy, and she's a voting member on the committee this year, and she also oversees the 1,200 employees of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. President Logan began this role in August of last year, and she kicked off the first year of her tenure with a 360 and 365 listening tour, visiting communities and stakeholders throughout all of the 11th district. In fact, this is Lori's third visit to Houston in six months. Prior to becoming Dallas Fed president, she managed the system open market account for the FOMC and was an executive vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In that role, she managed the Federal Reserve securities portfolio as it grew to more than eight trillion, that's trillion with a T, and led the implementation of monetary policy as directed by the FOMC. President Logan also played a crucial role in the development and implementations of the Fed's actions in response to COVID-19. And on a personal note, let me just add that we are truly fortunate to have someone at the helm of the Dallas Fed with the vision, with the intellect, and the superb leadership that Lori embodies. So please join me in a warm welcome for Lori Logan. Good afternoon. 
Happy International Women's Day. And thank you, Darren, uh, for the too kind uh, introduction. And thank you to the Houston World Affairs Council for bringing us together for this first International Women's Day Symposium. It's really an honor uh, to be able to be here and, and to open today's events. At the Federal Reserve, our work is all about advancing an economy where everyone has opportunities to thrive. And at the Dallas Fed, we call it building a strong economy together. So days like today are so important in that effort. And we celebrate the trailblazers who have shaped our communities. And we call for more opportunities and commit to working together to get there. Because as far as we've come toward a more equitable, inclusive economy, I think all of us here know we still have a long way to go. So it wasn't too long ago I was on a flight uh, from Dallas to New York, and it was the day after um, the announcement uh, that I had become or been named uh, president of the Dallas Fed. And I was preparing on that flight uh, to send some, to share some goodbye remarks uh, with the team that I'd worked for for over 23 years upon my return. And so I was feeling a little bit emotional about preparing those remarks. And there was a woman who was sitting in the aisle right next to me, and I think she, she, she sort of saw me, and I, I thought I was containing myself, but there must have been a few tears. And so she looked at me, and she, she said, you know, are you okay? Um, you know, thinking that, that something uh, may have been wrong, or someone may be sick in my family, or, or something. And I, I was just embarrassed, you know. But I, I said I was fine, and, uh, and we... Uh, and I thanked her, and, and she went back to, to reading the, the news on her phone. And then a few minutes later, she turned to me again, and she held up her phone, and she showed me. Uh, it was the Dallas Morning News, and she said, is this you? <laughs> now I'm doubly embarrassed. And I said, uh, I said yes, it's, it's me. And, and we chatted for the rest of the, the flight about Dallas, about Texas, about family, about our children. And her, uh, she was going to visit her daughter. Uh, who is attending Columbia University, which is just right in the area where I was living in New York at the time. So when we landed, uh, we got up to leave, uh, the, leave the plane, and she introduced me to her husband. And she said, um, I want to introduce you to Lori. She's going to be um, the president of the Dallas Fed, and her family is going to be relocating here to Dallas. And he welcomed me uh, to Dallas and was excited for my family, and he wished my husband well in his new job. I said, no, I'm going to be the president of the Dallas Fed. And he said, you? I said, yes, I'm going to be the president of the Dallas Fed, and my family is relocating with me. And now it was his turn to be a bit embarrassed. <laughs> now, I've had my fair share of conversations like these over the years because I've held enough jobs where I was the first, the only, or one of very few women in the room. I was the first woman to manage the Fed's open market trading desk in New York. And when I joined the Fed 23 years ago, there was just a handful of women on the trading desk. That was it, a handful. Since then, more and more women have joined both that team and the financial sector more broadly. And last year, women held just over half of financial services jobs in the United States. But still, too few reach positions of leadership. And research has found that the odds of getting to those roles are even lower for women of color. To put it bluntly, we need more women in finance, we need more women in economics, and we need more women leaders, and broader representation across all demographics at those tables. Now, we're all here today because we are passionate about doing our part to bring about change. Each of us has a critical part to play by speaking up, and using our voices, by bringing our unique perspectives to the table, by inviting others and pulling them to that table, and by being worthy leaders. Men, too, have an equally important part to play. Women can't and shouldn't have to make this change alone. So later today, we'll hear from a number of incredible panelists about four key concepts, leadership, empowerment, achievement, and diversity. And in my career, I've learned some important lessons about each of these. So I thought to kick off today's conversations, I wanted to share just a couple of reflections. First, a lesson about leadership. 
you haven't arrived until you've brought others along with you. Now every year, the Kansas City Fed hosts an economic symposium in Jackson Hole. It's the premier annual conference for the world's central bankers and for economists who study monetary policy. A little over a decade ago, there were very few women in attendance of the entire symposium. And rarely would we see a woman on the panel or as a, a, a panel leader or on the agenda of the research papers that were being studied. But last year, I had the opportunity to be there in August, and there were eight women panelists in chairs, nearly half of the total, and there were dozens of women in attendance. So what happened in between? Well, in 2011, Esther George became president of the Kansas City Fed, and Esther was the first woman to hold that role, and she knew her work to bring others along was just beginning. She insisted on diversifying the conference papers and the panels, and she launched an event at the symposium just for women. And that was an opportunity to both network and also to share ideas about how we can pull other women into the room. She set an example that led to many more talented women and important institutions leading other important conversations in economics and finance. And for example, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve Board, and the European Central Bank have now organized four conferences starting in 2018 to specifically address issues of gender and career progression. Now something similar happened to me when Christine Lagarde visited the New York Fed several years ago. It was about that same time. I think Christine and Esther started in those roles uh, in 2011. And for those of you who don't know much about Christine Lagarde, she is the first woman to be president of the European Central Bank. And before that, she was the first woman to head the International Monetary Fund. And before that, she was the first woman to be finance minister of a G8 economy. So when she walked into a meeting with financial market executives at the New York Fed, she entered a room of a sea of men of blue shirts. She told the leadership at the time, now I wasn't in the room, this was reported to me, that she would not return to participate in a meeting if she came to a room of a sea of blue shirts. She expected there to be women at the table or she would not participate. I was at that next meeting, along with a few other women, the direct result of her leadership in bringing others along. And as I've moved forward in my own career, I've kept those remarkable women in mind and their examples of leadership and what we all have to do to pull women into the room. And that's true for both big policies and in our daily decisions. I was listening last night to LinkedIn and Christine Lagarde was speaking on International Women's Day and she said her job was not only to build pathways but to create highways uh, for women in leadership. So I hope that will be part of our conversation today. The second lesson is about empowerment. People often think of empowering mentors as those who cheer us on and emphasize the positive. But to me, true empowerment means authentic, honest, candid feedback. My very best mentors didn't just open doors for me, they mostly pushed me through those doors by encouraging me to take on challenges I didn't know I was prepared for at the time. And when my work didn't meet the test, they told me how it could be better. Their toughness was a gift. More importantly, empowerment includes sponsorship. And throughout my career, sponsors have brought me to important meetings and made sure I got credit for the ideas of my work. They amplified my voice in the meeting by repeating the messages I had said and by referring them to me because too often men get credit for ideas that were originated by women. To them, empowerment wasn't just cheerleading in private, it was a public effort to create real and meaningful opportunity. The third lesson is about achievement. If we want true inclusion, we need to rethink what makes a strong resume. Too often, some of women's most important skills and accomplishments don't appear on our resume at all. Consider the many women who had to leave the paid workforce during the pandemic. Anyone with young kids can tell you that parenting a toddler is a nonstop crisis management exercise. <laughs> and serious managerial skills is needed to keep a household running, particularly amid the disruptions of a global pandemic. Thought-provoking academic research quantifies the skills needed for various kinds of work, including non-market work such as parenting. And this research finds across many countries that women's qualifications, contrary to those of men, 
are much higher than the skills they actually employ in their jobs. Yet do employers consider all of these abilities? If not, these women may very well continue to be employed in jobs below their ability or be turned down for jobs when our economy needs them the most. Finally, a lesson on diversity. We must think beyond gender representation. A critical part of my job is to travel across the Federal Reserve's 11th District and engage with business and community leaders across Texas, northern Louisiana, and southern New Mexico. And in these interactions, I see firsthand that gender diversity is critical. But it's not enough. To make the best decisions, to achieve better outcomes, we need to listen to a vast range of perspectives. From women, yes, and specifically black, Latina, Asian, and Native American women. Women of different geographic areas and socioeconomic backgrounds, women who bring different abilities and viewpoints to the work that they do. And not only do we need to bring people to that table, we need to commit to making sure everyone at that table is truly heard, truly respected, and truly valued. So we're far from where we need to be. Here at the Fed, in finance and economics, and all across the country. And that's why gatherings like this one are so important. We can speak honestly about where we are, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there. And I'm thrilled to have you all here to learn from the amazing panelists that have been assembled and to celebrate International Women's Day doing what we all do best, rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. So I look forward to getting to it. I mentioned that today's sessions focus on leadership, empowerment, achievement, and diversity lead. And in keeping with that theme, I'd like to hand it over to our lead and our creator of this event, Sonia Bayou, to introduce the next part of our program. Thank you so much. Gee, what a welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining me today, and thank you for deciding and opting to be with us today. So I thank you for your choice. You didn't have to be there, but you chose to collect yourself. <laughs> um, today, uh, as I mentioned, and thanks for all of you. So, so thrilled, thrilled to see this to fruition, as Darren mentioned also, to come from something a day of six months ago to actually having full house, as in full. Uh, over capacity full to have beautiful decor, happy smiley faces, uh, beautiful aesthetics, and just you don't even know what the afternoon is full of surprises besides the useful, impactful, meaningful conversations as well. But they are really cool prizes. So before I forget, obviously this is very important. Uh, if you did not uh, put your business card in the bowl for the prize, uh, we have conveniently located some of these. I know some of you came at a later time. Fill this out. So we can make sure put you in the raffle and you can win those door prizes. So if you did fill it out, raise your hands and my colleagues will collect them for you. Again, for you to join the, the raffle, very, very important. A couple of house rules here as well. Um, and we'll go and go ahead to that as well. We do have a program on the table, agenda that will stick to it and go through it. And I'll have the pleasure of being your lead uh, for the day and as we talk through as well. Again, that is for your convenience, make notes uh, and to enjoy as well. But this event really would not be possible, again, I said, because of you and because of our sponsors. And with that, I do want to recognize today, today's our sponsors. Our panel sponsor, SLB, thank you. Our gold sponsors, Astros Foundation, ExxonMobil, HESS, KPMG. Our silver sponsors, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Houston Branch, Oppenheimer, Sasol, Siemens Energy, Texas Children's Hospital, World Oil Field Machine. Thank you all for your sponsorship. As noted in the agenda, uh, I have selected special friends of uh, the organization uh, to introduce each panel. So you, uh, you'll see me asking them to join me, and they will have the pleasure of introducing today panelists as well as uh, moderators. As I lead into that, uh, you see our first panel getting ready to assemble. Any questions so far? All good. Uh, if you would just also, just a quick reminder, turn off your uh, volume on the phone. I know we are all working. 
we shouldn't. We are here to enjoy the afternoon. But uh, I know there is that big world out there. How could you? But uh, you are here. So if you just lower that volume again, I know you have uh, other responsibilities. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask Adriana Calhoun to join as we will open the first panel of today, diversity panel, achieving her story in culture in industry. Adriana Calhoun, AC Media, President and CEO, six-time Emmy winner, <laughs> four-time Tele Award winner, and she will have the honor today of introducing today's panel. And I do want to say this note, uh, Dr. Laura uh, Maria was scheduled to be here. She called me this morning that she was under the weather. So her tremendous apologies. You know her, her energy. She would just love, 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 love to be here. So as we were going to pivot, uh, I have to salute Adriana. I said, Adriana, we ha get lemons. Can we make lemonade? You have two hours. <laughs> so I said, you are here. You're a fantastic individual with achievement yourself. You're here to introduce the panel. Can you do both? She says, I am in. So with that, if you join me in welcoming Adriana with the, to join the panel and introduce. Adriana. Hola a todos, muy buenas tardes. Y feliz día de la mujer. Thank you, Sandia. Very nice introduction. And I want to thank uh, the World Affairs Council for inviting me to this incredible event. It's really, it's a big honor uh, to introduce, introduce a group of influential and powerful women in our community. Paula Harris, Senior Vice President of Community Affairs for the Houston Astros and the Executive Director of the Astros Foundation. With 33 years of experience in international oil field services, she managed business activities on every continent but Antarctica. <laughs> she received the Women Who Mean Business Lifetime Achievement Award from the Houston Business Journal. She has also authored and published two books, The Guide for professional black women, and when I grow up, I want to be an engineer. Please help me welcoming Paula Harris. <laughs> Nina Stuffberg, Chief Financial for Sassel Chemicals America Region, originally from South Africa. Nina also serves on the American Leadership Team and the Global Chemicals Executive Committee. Please help me welcoming Nina Stolberg. <laughs> this panel will be moderated by Estelle Jolly Saint. She is the Corporate and Financial Communication Manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. As part of the company media and analysis team, she has extensive experience in public affairs, and she is also a great champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, let us enjoy this panel with these great leaders. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be with all of you on this International Women's Day. Uh, we have a terrific conversation lined up um, as we dive into diversity and inclusion. During our discussion, we'll explore and learn the critical role diversity and inclusion plays in how we lead and build relationships and trust with peers, colleagues, and team members. So with that, I would like to start our conversation with a very simple question of what brings you here today, why today, why now? Who would like to start? Of course I'll start. <laughs> what brings us here today is International Women's Day. And it's, I think about this as a time to reflect and to remember from whence we came, right? To hear the president of the Federal Dallas Reserve, a female. And I wasn't sure because someone said he, and I think they were referring to you, and I said, well, I thought Marie was a woman. I thought I saw a woman's <laughs> picture. And she was, I mean, what a way to kick it off. How inspiring. Thank you for, this is why we're here today, to celebrate 
to see how far we've come. I started in the oil industry and to see to look over at SLB's table and it's predominantly women and women that I know and women with boss jobs, right? <laughs> to look over at the Astros and KPMG and see women who I know who 20 years ago we weren't in these positions. And so I totally agree we have such a long way to go and we will continue to fight and forge away. But just to celebrate, man, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think I can say it as well as you said it, though. So um, I, I think what attracted me is a day to celebrate leadership, empowerment, achievement, diversity. And I'm very passionate about diversity and inclusion. And then obviously to network with all of these wonderful people in the room and, and then the champagne. I'm not going to lie, but the champagne <laughs> did attract me. That's a draw. <laughs> Well, um, I'm a Mexican, and they say, we need, we need and we will celebrate the International Women's Day. Obvious, I say, yes, yeah, celebration, I will be there. <laughs> but also to learn about you, yeah. because uh, be together and stay together and learning uh, by another woman is empower yourself. And that is the reason why I'm here. Well, thank you so much, panelists. I, I am looking forward to that champagne, too. <laughs> um, so as women leaders with multifaceted identities, which we also like to call intersectionality, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you, and what does it mean at the workplace? You want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> so um, diversity for me, and, and I'll use the saying that we use at Sassel, um, DNI is in your DNA. Mm. So um, it's really about who you are. It's that uniqueness that you have in you that no one else in the world has. It's the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, um, your thought process, all of that makes you you, and that's the diversity. Um, inclusion is then the, the magic ingredient to get the most out of that uniqueness. It's collaborating all these different pieces to make the magic happen almost. And you can't do diversity without inclusion. You just can't. And it comes about having everyone sitting here and no one has a voice. So what have we achieved if we don't have inclusion? So it's creating that culture in a company that's safe for people to speak up, to participate, to share their ideas. That gets us to better business solutions because the world is so volatile right now that what we use in the past will never work in the future. So we need these ideas and these thoughts and this diversity coming out. And that's for me how diversity and inclusion connects. And, you know, it's really awesome to feel you get celebrated for who you are. You don't have to be anyone else. Well, um, to me, diversity is the great opportunity to uh, let our business grow into. It's, uh, the, the world is changing, and the ones we want to play in this world and be successful, we need to be open to learn and accept diversity and also uh, the opportunity to learn about another culture, another lifestyle that we can turn in our business like a new business opportunity. Because you can reach another market, another clients. And also, like a video uh, journalist, I will say diversity crew is like I have a lens in the camera. You can see through in different ways to solve the problems, you know, address the problems, or the challenges we already have every day, and open a new opportunities. That is the reason why I think uh, have diversity, inclusion in our company is be open to be successful. And just to recap that, that's absolutely right. When we go into our offices every day or we go into our jobs and we're looking to grow our business, our clients, our um, profitability, we have to, in this day and time, be able to engage with anyone and everyone at all different levels. And if we're going to do that, we cannot go in with a monolithic, homogeneous, 
group anymore. And I think people understand the business reasons mm -hmm. of this multi-sectionality uh, mm -hmm. or um, this inversion of people. So, you, you know, I started in the oil industry in the 80s, and everything was very homogeneous, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> so I would say, as we look at things now, and you see your ability to be versatile. For years, I taught a sales training, and it was talking about how you need to be versatile. But it's not just you personally, which you do. You need to be able to interact with different types of people at different places and different times, but your organization has to be versatile. Mm -hmm. You have to reach any client where they are. You have to, you're not gonna, you're gonna get folks who are male, female, different cultures, different, um, gen well, I said genders, but different people who are just alike, who don't jive, right? Who can't see eye to eye. So your ability to send in a diverse group of uh, salespeople, business decision makers, your ability to say, okay, well that didn't work, so let's go back to the, to the bench, you know, and bring out another picture, you know? You have to be able to have a diverse mindset, diverse experiences, diverse backgrounds, diverse everything, because if you want to win, we've seen too often something just, you know, you open the paper and something just blew up because someone put an ad out there that a diverse group didn't obviously didn't look at. And so all of a sudden your, your shareholders are upset, all the stakeholders, and the stock prices are going down, and sales are, are bad because, simply because you didn't have a diverse set of eyes looking at whatever it is. And so this happens day in and day out on smaller levels. You know, people making decisions with homogeneous, the same folks, everyone, you said blue shirt, I say white shirt with a blue tie, with the same group. <laughs> And that's all the way up. You know, you need this kind of diversity com throughout your complete chain, right? And so when you think about multi-dimensions, and it's your ability to think differently because you had a different background, because you come from a different place, because you've had a different experience. And your ability to mix, mix match, and meet people where they are, your ability to be versatile is what makes that diversity work for you business-wise. Thank you so much. Um, so you were talking a little bit about kind of how diversity and inclusion works in the workplace, but I'm sure that your definition of DEI also influenced how you lead as well. Your identities, your multifaceted identities have shaped your leadership style. So how has that shaped your leadership style? Okay. okay. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I see the path like in the football, <laughs> in the soccer. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in my business, it's every day. You know, uh, we cover stories. The urban journalist stories. The what happened in the real life. And for us to have uh, the diversity in our crew gave us the opportunity to reach more audience too. But uh, for in our company, and we are talking about the experience we, we have, is we see, we need to live in the, we need to live in the opportunities, we need to live in the, the field, the playing field, and let everybody play. Mm -hmm. Because everybody has something us to give it to you, and the final product will be in a benefit for your final client, client or for your community. It's not only about, oh yeah, welcome to my team and that's it, and he will be in the share forever, or you will tell them exactly what you want they do it. Let them bring their experience, their um, talent, and I, I swear to God, you will surprise the results, the final results. But I think we are too afraid. Because when we don't understand something, we scare. Mm -hmm. And know everybody is fearless and say, okay, let's do it. We have clients. We need to support our business. We need to make money. Yes, but not everything is about money. 
how your company are impacting the community, not only with the, 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 the final product, how you are impacting the families with the employees you have in your company. And if you are worried about take care of others, why we don't take care of our team? And see what is the opportunity for each member of your team. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter where they are from, doesn't matter uh, is the, uh, how, uh, what language they speak. Is you see like a leader, they need support in something specific, make the best investment you can make. Invest in them. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I think when when I looked at how DNI waved into my leadership style, it's really making sure that everyone is comfortable to speak up in the meetings because it's it's really looking at that safe space. And I'll I'll take myself. There there was times where I was the only woman in the room, mm -hmm. so you know how it feels to be in that position. And I think there's a lot of strength in that because it, it helps you understand how someone else can feel, right? So it's understanding sitting in a setting that it's not always easy to speak up and share your ideas. And what do I need to do as a leader to make it comfortable for people to speak up and to draw their ideas out? Um, making sure that the quieter ones, maybe that have the idea that's still building up that courage, that I pull that out and get them to participate. And then sharing the ideas and listening, it, it's, I think there's something about fully listening to someone when they speak, right? Listening with, I'm almost gonna say your whole body, you immersed in what they're saying, and then taking it one step further and use their ideas. Because it's, there's nothing so discouraging by sharing your ideas, and no one does anything with it. Why would you share it again, mm -hmm. right? So then taking, and that speaks to what you said about opening your own mind and challenging yourself because it's scary. You don't know this, but you have to give it a try because then, then you unlock that magic, right? So I think in my leadership style, it's creating that collaborative culture where people feel safe enough to share their ideas and to open to listen to it. Uh, I think there's something about making mistakes as well, mistakes is not all bad, right? It seems to be a bad thing, but you learn through making mistakes. It's like I always think of a baby, how many times do you fall before you stand up, right? And before you walk. Yet at the workplace, you can't make mistakes, right? It's especially not if it's a material error and you have auditors reporting it, then you go bad, right? <laughs> so, but you have to have that space where you can make mistakes and learn and understand why the mistakes make and not try to find who, who's the bad guy here. Let's learn from what we do, let's share what we've done wrong and use that as an example for others, that as a team we grow and we get better. Excellent, excellent. Um, I think growing up in male-dominated careers, um, you, 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 you mimic or you look at other managers, right? And you see what you like and kind of what you don't want to replicate. And so I think about times where people were like, I treat everybody the same. I treat all the women the same, and then I treat all the guys the same. And I know that's what you were doing, because I was always that one woman who was treated a little differently, right? So you, you say, well, we're not going to do that. And I really, really, from that, probably totally different, I treat everyone differently. I make sure I meet them as a manager or director or senior vice president where they are. What can bring the best out of you? Where do you shine? Where do you want to grow? Where do I think you need growth? So everyone is different, you know? It's kind of like um, being a mother of kids, and you're like, I, I love all of you, but differently. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and you do, you, you, uh, because you want people to be successful, and yet you want people to, you know, to push where they need development, but at the same time, if this is where you shine, and this is where you do good, and I can take that off my plate, you run with it. You know, and I don't even have to think about that. And the parts that we do have to think about and work with and talk together. So it, in, whether it's male or female or young or old, which is the big diversity right now, right? How do you handle mature people versus how you handle people who like to work from the bed? So it's a little different. <laughs> God, are you kidding me? <laughs> so we, we all have growth to do here. 
but it is. It's, it's finding what brings out the best in all and, and making sure we, we, make, we maximize performance based on your ability to con contribute and my ability to mentor. So I, this goes back to the workplace a little bit. Um, what are some of the barriers that you have experienced when it comes to diversity and inclusion? And um, how do we identify those barriers and how do we mitigate them? So I'll start first this time. Um, you know, corporate has evolved, okay. right? Um, there was a time in oil and gas, all over oil and gas, and I truly believe I worked for a company that was very much on the forefront. The fact that they would send me offshore, and 99% of the time I was the only female, the only African American, a big headache to our clients because they didn't have facilities or space for me, and SLB said, this is who we have. She's your engineer, you deal with her, right? And so I would say watching this evolution of diversity being accepted has been very interested in the same thing in banking, same thing in retail, the same thing in audits. It's just watching companies grow. And there was a time where ERG, only one or two companies had resource groups. We want everyone to be alike. We don't want you to separate because you're a female. We don't want you to be go to a meeting because you're African American or because you are uh, Hispanic or gay. Or We want everyone. And, and that was something I fought long and hard for with, um, with SLB and the fact that those type of activities are so embraced now and taken advantage of by the corporate, you know, appreciated. And so watching, watching that kind of growth or watching you be able to go to organizations or be a part of National Society of Black Engineers or of the Hispanic CPAs or anything like that that you can grow and be around and feel comfortable really, really comfortable you with your tribe as you go back to corporation and be the only one. And uh, seeing companies appreciate that is really, really, that kind of development has helped people in their careers. Because I'm going to tell you, we walked in the door in the 80s and 90s, and you're the only female. And it was like, well, I'm the only woman. OK, let's just do it. The kids today, they're not accepting it. They're not. They say, you have no woman, women. You have no diversity. That is not where I want to be. And so we have to embrace diversity for business reasons and to make sure we get the top talent. So we have to let people shine where they are or be able to have ERGs or be able to um, reinvigorate by mentoring others that uh, are that being very, very much so promoted to say, you mentor this person because she looks like you or she has the same background or he thinks like you or whatever. And so uh, watching that evolution and the importance of recruiting and retaining talent based on your ability to embrace and recognize folks aren't walking in the door and looking up and saying, I don't see a pathway, but I'm going to forge a way because I want to break ceilings and I want to be there. They aren't doing it. They're saying, hey, if you don't respect diversity, I don't want to be here. So that's where we are. Yeah, I think for me, and I'll, I'll tell a story first, OK? So um, you can stop me if it goes too long. <laughs> so um, if I think about barriers, when, when I started working, and I, um, I'm a chartered accountant by, by profession, so I started doing my articles at one of the big four firms. I, I won't mention them. Um, it's not KPMG. <laughs> so, uh, so before I go on with the story. So um, I was a first year clerk, and we were on this audit, one of my first audits, and um, the partner was there, and the partner is like a really senior person. I mean, it's like, uh, you look, he's not above me, he's like way above me. And I could barely look at him. So I was um, there working, ticking and tying with, uh, at that stage still with a green pen. So I was doing that, and every day at 11, exactly 11, we would get tea. And the tea would come, and he would look at me and say, Nina, pour the tea. And I would get up and pour everyone's tea and again hand everyone their cups while they continue working. And that happened every day. So after a while, it, it really started bugging me. And I looked around the room, and I was also the only woman in the team. It's okay, So I'm like, hmm. Um, because at home, that's what my grandmother does. She serves my grandfather tea every day. 
So I'm like, this is my not, could not be a coincidence that he's asking me. <laughs> so um, then it gets to that almost psychological barrier, right? So now I wanted to speak up to this partner, but it takes a lot of courage because remember, he's right there and I'm right there. So um, the tea came, I built up. It took about three days to get the courage going. And the tea came the day, I did nothing that morning, nothing. I was just waiting for the tea. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so eventually, 11 o'clock, the tea came. And he didn't even look up. He said, Nina poured the tea, in like a gruff voice. And I'm like, what if someone else pours the tea today? Then he looked up. And he stared at me. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and it felt like a very long time. It probably wasn't. And then after a while, he turned to my fellow first year clerk and he said, Charles, pour the tea. <laughs> and Charles <laughs> poured the tea. <laughs> and that for me, you know, it was a really small victory, but in my mind, it was a huge <laughs> victory. And we took turns ever from that day onwards to pour tea. And I learned a lot that day about speaking up and taking that courage and your voice and owning your voice, right? Um, it made a big difference for me and my career just from tea. And um, I, I try to think that the barriers we have are two things. One is in ourselves, having that courage and that voice to speak up. And the other barrier is that is the company making it safe enough mm -hmm. for us to speak? Is there any repercussions that you face when you speak up and you raise issues? Or is it welcomed? Um, and that's the two things we need to almost marry, making sure we create that culture, but also that we make it we brave, right? We speak up when we see something that's not right. Because by speaking up and sharing stories with others, it encourages people to do the same. Barry, for me, is not a problem because it's no in my vocabulary. It doesn't matter if it's in Spanish or English. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's a sign, it's a new opportunity. Because I, if I see something is like new for me, it's okay, it's a new time to learn something new. That's it's exciting. It's a new adventure. But it's very important, like uh, you said, uh, you need to, you need, first you need to talk with yourself. I really want to be here. I'm in the correct company. It's, uh, um, the values of the company is like my values, or I need, or they ask me to change that, or I need to change that to be here, like a woman, or like a professional, we need to respect ourselves first. And after that, um, we always need to be proud for our roots mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and be uh, fearless. That's it. And the new chapter you will take will give you a new opportunities and will give you a new, a new excitement. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as we wrap up our conversation, I would like to ask you for any last minute takeaways, any last minute guidance or advice that you would like to share with the audience today. I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> so I, I think be unapologetically yourself, okay? Um, speak up. Don't be shy, but challenge yourself as well when other people speak up to f fully listen to what they're saying. Um, care deeply. It's something I think is really important. The world can be a really tough space, right? And there's a lot of harshness there. So care deeply. I think that truly makes a difference. And um, I'll end with one of my favorite quotes from Rolf Waldo Emerson. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So. Nice. I think as women, as we celebrate International Women's Day, we have to think about giving ourselves grace. So many times it's like, be fearless, which you should, but every day you won't be fearless. Some days you're gonna be scared. Or you should say, you know, even, you know, work hard, which we should. But some days we're tired. We have a lot going on. <laughs> so I, I really at this, and, and the main thing is all of this is a, 
um, is a growing, um, evolving part of you and who you are. You're not going to walk in your first day on a new job or you know, I'm my first day on a board and say, hey, I'm fearless and I'm here to add a lot of value. <laughs> and I have to give myself grace, right? I need to learn this stuff on a new job or a new day. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't know it all, if you don't have it all together, as long as you are working towards, you know, bringing value, growing yourself. And I really like what Lori said about until you are bringing others with you, it's not good enough to say, I'm proud. I'm the only woman that's ever been, th no, I want the second, and I want to help the third, and the fourth, and the fifth get there also. So I just say, you know, I think we are too tough on ourselves as women. I think, I, and I, I know for a fact, I live with a man, I work with a lot of men, they're just not that hard on themselves. They're okay. <laughs> they're okay with mistakes. They're okay with driving in the wrong lane. They are okay. <laughs> so... Not to, not to say anything bad about me, and I think that is something we should replicate. We should give ourselves a little bit more grace and a little bit more um, uh, allowances to make mistakes and to grow into this phenomenal business, professional, mom, uh, everything that we, all the titles and the, the hats that we wear. And, and I will say supporting other women. This is the best we can do. You really inspire me, and I I always talk about uh, with your speech. I always talking about the first enemy for another woman is a woman, and we need to change that. We need to start to change that. The world is changing. We need to change that part because most more women will be in whatever industry or will be the leaders. Is a better world for everybody. A woman, it means a family. A strong woman means an better opportunities. And is, I have a daughter, 14 years old daughter. And I'm very involved with the human trafficking. I'm very involved with the um, domestic violence because that is the kind of stories I cover. When I saw that, and I said, I, I need to bring what I learned for that testimonies to the new generations. Speak out, yes, speak out. Respect yourself, be brave, and always be humble and help others. Happy International Women's Day. Well, thank you so much, Adriana and Nina and Paula, um, for sharing your stories and experiences. I hope that we take away some of the incredible lessons learned and the gems that our panelists have shared with us today so we can um, use our uh, sphere of influence so um, <laughs> we can continue to make a difference and also help others. Thank you so much. Thank you.